Hello, everyone. I'm Zhao Chuan. In this video, we will meet Russo the Coronosaurus. You may be unfamiliar with this dinosaur, as there is limited fossil evidence and research conducted on this species. Fossils of Coronosaurus were unearthed in Alberta, Canada, where it lived alongside many well-known dinosaurs such as Centrosaurus, Albertosaurus, and Dyspoletosaurus. It can be dated back about 76 million years ago. Some estimates suggest roughly within a period between 76.5 and 76.2 million years ago. Coronosaurus is a typical ceratopsian and resembles the commonly depicted centrosaurine dinosaurs. It had a relatively small head, a broad body, a shortened tail, and limbs that were relatively slender compared to later ceratopsians. Overall, this dinosaur was quite robust and large. Despite limited fossil evidence, it is estimated that Coronosaurus could generally reach 5 meters long, rarely exceeding 6 meters, with most individuals estimated to be about 5 meters in length. At first glance, its appearance strongly reminds us of Centrosaurus. When this dinosaur was first named, it was believed to be a second species of Centrosaurus. It was indeed quite similar to Centrosaurus. Both dinosaurs share features such as a rounded, thick head, a short frill, and similar drooped, hook-like structures atop the frill. However, unlike Centrosaurus, Coronosaurus did not possess two inwardly curved, hook-like, horn-shaped epiparietals in this area. Instead, it had a chaotic, clustered, cauliflower-like structure, just like what this model shows. Because of its striking resemblance to Centrosaurus, with only minor differences, it was initially classified as a second species of Centrosaurus and named Centrosaurus brinkmani. The type species of Centrosaurus is Centrosaurus apatus. Thus, when Coronosaurus was first described in 2005, it was introduced as Centrosaurus brinkmani. For a long time, it was considered just a second species of Centrosaurus, due to their extreme similarity. However, scientists gradually identified fundamental differences between Coronosaurus and Centrosaurus, particularly in certain skeletal features, which showed significant divergence. Later, additional specimens confirmed that Coronosaurus was indeed a distinct genus, rather than merely a second species or variant of Centrosaurus. Now, let's take a closer look at the head of this dinosaur. Regarding restoration, very few skull remains of this dinosaur have been discovered. However, by proportionally reconstructing it, we can still notice that its nasal horn is positioned further back compared to that of Centrosaurus. The specimen preserved with the nasal horn shows this part to be relatively thin and short. Additionally, its brow horns, also known as supraorbital horns, are absent in some specimens while others show no developed horns at all. This variability is reminiscent of Centrosaurus, where horn development differs among species and even among individuals, resulting in highly diverse horn shapes. This genus is no exception. However, if Centrosaurus brinkmani, which was later reclassified as a separate genus called Coronosaurus, had present brow horns, the horns projected outward to the sides, and some of them were quite long. In our restoration, we made them more modest, with relatively short brow horns extending sideways. Moreover, it had downward curving epiparietals in this area, similar to those of Centrosaurus. Another difference from Centrosaurus is that, when viewed from the front, its skull resembles that of Chasmosaurus, larger and broader. Its frill is more extensive, not as small as in some Centrosaurus specimens. As mentioned earlier, it features downward curving frill spikes, which are accompanied by a seemingly chaotic cluster of structures above them. There are also structures similar to those found in Centrosaurus that project outward to the sides. At first glance, this area appears messy, but upon closer examination, you can discern a specific pattern. Resembling Centrosaurus, it has drooping spikes. The arrangement of these small spikes might seem tangled, but careful observation reveals two prominent, 
relatively large spikes pointing inward. These correspond to the small inward curving spikes atop the Centrosaurus frill. The surrounding jumbled cactus-like structures are actually spines derived from the ring of small scales that encircled each frill. To put it simply, you can think of it as a large central spike, surrounded by smaller scale derived spines. This is what makes it unique. The structure here is the same as that of Centrosaurus. It didn't develop any new structure, but rather modified versions of existing ones. You can see two small upward pointing spikes in this area, followed by two larger spikes curving backward. Viewed from above, these two main horns curve rearward, similar to many other ceratopsians, including later Pike Rhinosaurus. These two pairs of epiparietals always form such an arrangement. Beyond these features, there isn't much else that distinguishes it from Centrosaurus. The rest is generally reconstructed based on Centrosaurus. Some reconstructions depict the mouth as quite pointed, but we typically restore it similarly to Centrosaurus. It also had large nasal cavities, following the Centrosaurus model. Its body appears arched, with a strongly curved back and a relatively flat pelvic region. The overall body was reconstructed as a typical Centrosaurine dinosaur, featuring stocky forelimbs and hindlimbs. The hindlimbs, in particularly, had massive, triangular thighs. Of course, its limbs are still somewhat slimmer in comparison to later Ceratopsians. It had relatively small forefeet, with five digits on each forelimb, two of which were slightly elevated and might barely touch the ground when walking. These two generally lacked claws. Each hind foot had four toes, with the small toe being non-weight bearing, lightly touching the ground, while the other three robust, padded toes supported the weight. Its tail was relatively slender. We reconstructed the body scales based on Centrosaurus, covering the skin in fine, densely packed, small scales interspersed with larger, coin-sized scales. Good. The above concludes our introduction to the reconstruction process of Coronosaurus. Thank you all.